Good evening, I'm Ben Hersey. Tonight, a very special Christmas Eve presentation here on TV 38 Movie Loft. It's a beloved tale that's been told in numerous film versions over the years. An adaptation of the well-known Charles Dickens story. A Christmas, Christmas Carol. A Christmas Carol. The Christmas Carol. Christmas Carol. A Christmas Carol. A Christmas Carol. Christmas Carol. A Christmas Carol. Once again, we meet Ebenezer Scrooge, the lonely old miser who had little time for Christmas cheer. Until he has his eyes opened by three ghosts who do their best to remind the bitter old man of the truth meaning of the season. Let me read to you what Charles Dickens himself wrote about this story. I've endeavored in this ghostly little story to raise the ghost of an idea. Which shall not put my readers out of humor with themselves, with each other, with the season, or with me. May it haunt their houses pleasantly, and no one wish to lay it, their faithful friend and servant. Charles Dickens! December 1843. I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my partner's house, for I have brethren that he may testify unto him, lest he also come to this place of torment. If someone from the dead goes to him, he will repent. Stave 1. Jacob's Ghost. Marley was dead, to begin with. There's no doubt about that. In fact, I saw him die. This is not some unattributable comment. You have my on-the-record word, sir. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it. And Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. So, for all practical purposes, Marley was as non-viable as a doornail. Mind, I don't mean to say that I know of my own knowledge what there is particularly dead about a doornail. But the wisdom of wordmongers is in creating the simile, and my undisciplined hands shall not amend it, for something might be lost in the telling. So permit me to repeat emphatically that Marley was dead as a doornail. Dead as a doornail. Dead as a fucking doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead? Of course he did. How could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor. His sole administrator. His sole assign. His sole residuary legatee. His sole friend. And sole mourner. The mention of Marley's funeral brings me back to the point I started from. Marley was dead. The Marleys were dead. Marley was dead. Why do we need to spend this much time? I don't on know. This? He's really kind of a, a bummer, this narrator. Marley's dead. This must be distinctly understood, or nothing wonderful can come of the story I'm going to relate. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name. There it stood, years afterwards, above the warehouse door. Scrooge and Marley. Scrooge and Marley. Scrooge and Marley. Everybody, as the phrase goes, knew the firm of Scrooge and Marley. For though Marley had long been dead at the period we have chosen for commencement of our story. Dick Teaser Splooge refused to change the sign for one reason only. Money. In the years since Marley's death, Scrooge had only become richer. London had since built a 12-foot wall around the city's perimeter to keep the undead out, of which Scrooge made quite a bit of profit on. Oh, the stingy Baron von Scrooge had money. He had made some very lucrative loans. Over 300,000 people had poured into Jerusalem, and Ebenezer did take financial advantage. Sometimes people new to the business called Scrooge Scrooge, and sometimes Marley. But he answered to both names. It, it was all the same to him. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. He, he was a real skin flat, he was. He just as stingy as they come. Ebenezer went by the screen name Tiny Tim and was hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire. Secretive and self-contained. And solitary as an oyster. He didn't like anything, except maybe all the dough he could get his hands on. A blue blood of the deepest indigo, he was born and carefully bred on one of the South's oldest plantations. Isolated from the world, he grew more bitter and twisted, cursing Autobot and human. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek and stiffened his gait. No one could warm. No wintry weather could chill him. He'll probably remind many of you of your landlord. 
Scrooge is the skeptic who dares to call tinsel tacky, the realist who eschews sentimentality. In short, if Ebenezer friended you online, you'd hit that block button in a heartbeat. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked. To edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance, was what the Knowing Ones called nuts to Scrooge. That Christmas, the fog had been squatting over London for weeks, eroding the spirits of the season. Then, on the afternoon of the 24th, the storm came. Once upon a time, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. We'll return to Saki Sackerman's Puppet Pals, do a really lame version of A Christmas Carol, right after we sell you some stuff. Come on, people, we only got two days to get this right, and action! Humbug! Cue Tiny Tim! Oh, dark walls, the balls are falling! Cut, 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 cut! What are you expecting two days? In two days, you could do all your holiday shopping at Ames. Look, it's the ghost of Christmas presents. You're watching John Carpenter's Christmas Carol on TV 38's Movie Loft here on WSBK TV, Boston. The next Christmas I'll be It was cold, bleak, biting weather. The cramped office is jam-packed with all sorts of Elvis merchandise. Uh, picture books, pop-ups, pre-signed autographs, albums all over the floor. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open so that he might keep an eye upon his clerk. Bob Cratchit, sitting, you know, not right next to him, but <laughs> pretty close. <laughs> Tight quarters in there. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so much smaller that it burned out. Subtly, Cratchit lurched out of his dingy chamber, shovel in hand as he tiptoed to the coal box. Cratchit, what do you think you're doing? Turning on the heat, that's what I'm doing. My fingers look like popsicles. I don't care if they come in six delicious flavors. Every time you turn on that heater, it costs me money. Scrooge humped and used her cane of pure onyx stone to kick the coal out of his hands, it landing in the emergency fuel bucket beside the stove. Mr. Scrooge pointedly looks up from the fallen coal and arches an eyebrow at me, and I squeak. I squeak because my mean, angry, bellowing boss is the hottest, sexiest man I've ever laid eyes on. He, of course, is completely oblivious to my melting ovaries, focused on the coal. Do you have any idea how much it takes to heat this place? Scrooge then asked his head accountant, and naturally, Cratchit did. It was an exorbitant amount. I'm sorry, Mr. Scrooge. The flame had gone out. Nonsense! Look at the blaze in that fireplace! Oh, that's nothing but some red paper with a candle behind it. Well, use your imagination, Cratchit. Next thing, you'll be picking my pockets. Oh, look, Mr. Scrooge. Your nephew, Fred, is coming to pay you a call. What's that fool want? Uncle Scrooge, Merry Christmas! Heaven save you. Merry Christmas. Bah humbug! 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 Christmas a humbug, Mr. Scrooge? You don't mean that, I'm sure. I do. Christmas spirit is a cancer. It just eats away at your core. Everyone's being so nice. And doing things for other people. It's totally disgusting. What right have you to be merry? You're poor enough. And what reason have you to be morose? You're rich enough. Bah humbug. Bah humbug. Bah humbug, Alexa. What is wrong with you? You are being a real screw. Oh, don't tell me you're like all these other seasonal ninnies that string Thanksgiving through New Year's together into one big annoying holiday. Good to watch it, Harold. The last guy to talk like this was visited by three ghosts on Christmas Eve. People can talk of fairy tales and fantastic magical creatures, but that does not make them real. Come on, Uncle. Don't be a Debbie Downer. What else can I be when I live in such a world of fools? Merry Christmas. Was Christmas time to you, but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer? If I had my way, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be killed. Boiled in his own pudding. Buried with a stake of holly through their heart. In the center of four lonely roads. <sighs> it's the thought that counts. No, it's the marketing that counts, Shyla. Don't be a sheep. Be a wolf. 
<laughs> Uncle. There must be something that can make you happy. Nephew, you keep Christmas in your way. I'll keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone, then. Much good may it do you. Much good it's ever done you. There are many things from which I have derived good. From which I have not profited, I dare say. Christmas among the rest. But I've always thought of Christmas as a good time. As a kind, forgiving, pleasant time. The only time I know of in the long calendar of the year. Where we can put the hustle aside, keep them swishes lit, and show each other love. When men and women seem by one consent to open their shut hearts freely. And to think of people below them as if they really were fellow passengers. Or as Dickens phrased in Little Dorrit, fellow travellers to the grave. And therefore, Uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket. I believe that it has done me good and will do me good and I say God, God bless it. it. The clerk in the tank involuntarily applauded. Then good old Scrooge, bless his heart, turned to Bob Cratchit and snarled, Cratchit! One more sand out of you and you'll be searching through the positions vacant. And there ain't too many positions vacant in Dandaloo Shire, I can tell you that. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir. It's a wonder you don't go into Parliament. Oh, Uncle, don't be cross. Come on. <laughs> Come dine with us tomorrow. You're my only family, and it would mean so much. Get out. Will you not be joining the festivities? I have even less use for Christmas than I do for you, Colossus. Bah humbug, bub. Bah humbug. Bah humbug. Bah humbug. Bah humbug. Bah humbug. Bah humbug. Boy humbug. Bah Humbug. Bah humbug, bitch. Now get out of my face. But this won't be a normal kind of party, Uncle, said his nephew Fred. You see, my wife and I enjoy a rather spicy married life. We like to involve other couples into our lovemaking. How about it, Mr. Jameson? Well, let me consider your peeling offer for a second. Uh, mm, no. Uh, but why? Why, why? Why did you get married? Because I fell in love with the lady. Love! <laughs> I'd rather thou hast said thee under some malicious spell been bound. Love without money is a bad investment. Good afternoon. Please, Uncle, dine with us. I want nothing from you. Can't we be friends? Good afternoon. I am sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute. <laughs> We've never had any quarrel that I've ever been party to. I made this trip in homage to Christmas. And I'll keep my Christmas humor to the last. Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a happy new year. Good afternoon! All right, fine, Uncle. I'm leaving. But before I go, I'd like to speak to prisoner Bob Cratchit. A Merry Christmas, Mr. Cratchit. Oh, thank you, sir. Merry Christmas to you, too, sir. <laughs> in leaving the shop, Scrooge's nephew let two other people in. They were portly gentlemen, pleasant to behold, and now stood in Scrooge's office. These bureaucrats were the result of endless government expansion, tasked with missions of uh, public good. The Red Keep, I believe. Have I the pleasure of addressing Lord Tywin or King Aerys Targaryen? Aerys Targaryen has been dead these seven years. My son, Jaime Lannister, drove his sword through the Mad King's back seven years ago this very night. We have no doubt his liberality is well represented by his surviving partner. At this festive season of the year... It is more than unusually desirable. We try to make some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at the present time. <laughs> many thousands are in want of common necessaries. And many hundreds of thousands lack ordinary comforts. The chief points to which we wish to call attention relate to the employment of women and children in these horrible subterranean works. Why, well, in some quarters, laborers must even pass a GED exam. What does knowledge of algebra have to do with a man's ability to work at a steel mill? <laughs> Are there no prisons? Oh, well, most certainly. We love to lock people up in this country. And the union workhouses, are they still in operation? They are, though I wish with all my heart they were not. The treadmill, the poor houses, still in full vigor. Very busy, sir. I was afraid from what you said at first that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course. I don't think you quite understand us, sir. A few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some tofu steaks and smoothies. What can I put you down for? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing! You wish to be anonymous. <laughs> I wish to be left alone and keep my money. I don't make merry myself at Christmas and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments I have mentioned. Those who are badly off must go there. Many would rather die than go to those places! 
Well, then perhaps they should, and decrease the surplus population. Scrooge wasn't about to be bullied by commie social justice warrior demons and become a beta cuck giving handouts to lazy welfare queens. You are positively debauching the district, sir, with your ill-advised giving. It's not my business. Not your business? Bitch, you crazy as hell. We're talking about kids. I mean, orphans who have nothing. When are you going to learn the difference between a business and a charity? Mr. Scrooge, a money key man policy simply makes good business sense. Bah humbug, bah humbug. Bah humbug. There was never such an age in the world in which the poor have been the subject of such tender, anxious interest, both from the public and individuals. A man who is born into a world possessed, if he cannot get subsidence from his parents, and if society do not want his labour, he, in fact, has no business to be where he is. At nature's mighty feast, there is no vacant cover for him. She tells him to be gone. Now, may I suggest that you gentlemen run along home and put bandages on those bleeding hearts? Excuse me and good night. All right. But when you get visited in the middle of the night by the ghost of Christmas future, don't come running to me. Damn, Toby, because you're exactly who I was going to come running to. You sad, pathetic queen! Haven't you heard every time my cash register rings, an angel gets its wings? The cold became intense. I do say, if the good St. Dunstan had nipped the evil spirit's nose with a touch of such temperature, indeed, he would have roared to lusty purpose. The owner of one's scant young nose stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole to regale him with a Christmas carol, but at the first sound of God rest you merry gentlemen, may nothing you dismay. Scrooge seized the ruler with such energy of action that the singer fled in terror. At length, the hour of closing up the counting house arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge dismounted from his stool and tacitly admitted the fact to the expectant clerk in the tank, who instantly snuffed his candle out. Excuse me, Mr. Scrooge? Yes, Bob? I was, I was just hoping that I could ask you just, you know, just one little question, if that's okay, if I could just take... Well, since you've interrupted my train of thought already, what? I wonder if I could possibly have a day off on Christmas Day. <laughs> if it's convenient, huh? It's most inconvenient. And it's not fair. If I was to stop half a bull for it, you'd think yourself ill-used. You're being paid to be here, are you not? Or perhaps you'd rather I replace you with a Yuko. But I have to take Tiny Tim to the doctor. You don't have kids. Tiny Tim is my nickname for my penis. Work on Christmas Day, Cratchit. These little trifles mean not a thing when you consider you have me. You should be gay. But, sir... It's Christmas! Old hat, Cratchit. That went out with button shoes. A poor excuse. For picking a gargoyle's pocket... Every 25th of December! I think this is totally unfair. <laughs> all right. Stay home tomorrow. But be here all the earlier on Boxing Day. Yes, sir. And a Merry Christmas to you, Mr. Scrooge. Christmas, bah, humbug. <laughs> All Christmas means to me is a nasty old cold. You should take NyQuil, sir. NyQuil? What's NyQuil? Nighttime cold medicine from Vicks. Got to go now. NyQuil? Bob Cratchit slumped out of the WWF offices. Ugh. Then ran home to Camden Town as hard as he could pelt. Scrooge sat alone. Googling at her desk. Without a friend in the world, he loved no one. He worshipped only money. The rich innkeeper was a poor lost soul, sitting alone in his darkened room. Scrooge remained at his desk for a while to read the day's newspapers. Satisfied that no journalist had an inkling of his plans, he made his way out of his office. The immortal classic Scrooge will return after these messages.
having trouble sleeping, Scrooge? Marley, is that you? Why not buy yourself a Big Sur waterbed? Big Sur has a huge selection of waterbeds, many available in sizes for kids as well as adults. You're right, Marley, and at these penny-pinching prices, maybe I'll buy one for everyone in town. Nah. Big Sur waterbeds, 4830 University Drive, Northwest in Huntsville. We now return to Scrooge. After closing time, Scrooge walked through the crowded streets, taking no notice of the merry people rushing home to their loved ones. Scrooge silently cursed the throngs of merry punters lining the streets of the capital. Well, listen to me, that's in your Scrooge. Ah, humbug. Say that again and I'll pop a cap in your ass. <laughs> In his mind, he saw them as hordes of bloated ignorami, edging the country closer and closer to financial oblivion with every wasted Christmas pound. La, 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 la. Scrooge trudged through the snow-filled streets on her way to her house on the hill. The clink of his spurs accompanying each hard strike of his heel. He knew there'd be a celebration up in Rodath, but there'd probably be a lot of people at that shing-ding, and he'd had enough of people. Scrooge went off to his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern. And having read all the newspapers, he went home to bed. He then continued to trudge home, praying he wouldn't meet up with his lesbian wife, whom he'd managed to avoid sleeping with since the Vietnam War. Through the frost and the fog, Scrooge walked to his place. When there, on his knocker, he saw Marley's face. The metal visage twisted itself with a horrid rolling of its blue gleaming eyes into a grinning smile. It looked. At Scrooge, as Marley used to look. It was not in impenetrable shadow as the other objects in the yard were, but had the dismal light about it, like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. It was not angry or ferocious, but looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look. With ghostly spectacles turned up upon its ghostly forehead. The hair was curiously stirred as if by breath of hot air, and though the eyes were wide open, they were perfectly motionless. As unexpected as this would be, a typical Klingon would surely react with the disruptor shot the hallucinations face. Scrooge's stomach listed to the side like the Lewistania. Good heavens, I'm losing my mind. As Scrooge stared at this strange sight, the face became the brass knocker again. To say that he was not startled, or that his hardened dong suddenly went limp, would be untrue. Now, old Scrooge was never one to take a fright, but he locked all his doors and shut the windows so tight. You may talk vaguely about driving a coach and six up a good old flight of stairs, which is perhaps the reason why Scrooge thought he saw a locomotive hearse going on before him in the gloom. Bah! I will not be a victim of my own insecurities. Do you hear me, Phantasm? The apparition would have frightened most, but Scrooge felt secure in his top coat, for in his left pocket was his feather quill, in his right a gold coin, and close to his heart a lump of coal. Whoa, that's crazy. Up Scrooge went, not caring a button for it being very dark. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. But tonight he wouldn't have minded a brighter lamplight. Before he shut his heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. She checked the sitting room, the bedroom, the yoga room, all as they should be. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa, nobody in the closet. Quite satisfied, he closed his door and locked himself in. Everybody trying to rip off a Mario. 
Having showered and brushed his teeth, Scrooge sits down to enjoy a tasty bowl of jello pudding. I slurped, careful not to get any on Mr. Snazzy in case he'd wake up and yell at me. An icy wind blew through the room. <laughs> what was that? He could make out a telltale scurrying, and his stomach clenched at the possibility that a rat's nest lay somewhere in his home. Hetty cleaned up the remaining soup from her whiskers and stretched. <sighs> The bells ceased as they had begun, together. Ebenezer. Put some vibrato into it. Is it a ghost? Am I being Scrooged? I hate that. <laughs> Scrooged. Scrooge remembered hearing that ghosts in old houses sometimes pulled chains behind them. Scrooge Macher stood with his mouth open, so wide you could fit in a whole matzo ball. It's the boiler again. No, how could the boiler be climbing the steps? Oh my goodness, it could be a thief. I've got a rather large weapon in here, and I'm not afraid to use it. Flickering light of my solitary candle, I saw it. Its eyes were staring into mine, two dead eyes, tearing out of a dead face. Upon its coming in, the dying flame leaped up as though it cried, I know him. It's Marley's ghost. Marley's ghost. Marley's ghost comes back and he's got this huge, clanging, massive chain weighing him down. The same face. The very same. Marley in his pigtail, the usual waistcoat. Titty old grey cardigan over a black dress. The tassels on the latter bristling like his pigtail, and his coat skirts, and the hair upon his head. The chain he drew was clasped about his middle. It was long and wound about him like a tail. And it was made, for Scrooge observed it closely, of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. His body was transparent so that Scrooge, observing him, and looking through his waistcoat, could see the two buttons on his coat behind. Scrooge had often heard it said that Marley had no bowels, but he'd never believed it until now. Oh my God, a ghostly millennial. How did you get in here? Through the wall. Clearly I need to build a wall to keep out ghosts. Get on the floor. Mother, please. The night is short and we've got a lot of ground to cover. Marley then asked Ebenezer, why don't you take a seat? That's right, right over there. Stay away from me. I killed you once, I'll kill you again. I don't mind you hitting me, Frank, but take it easy on the Bacardi. What the? Hiya! Haven't changed much, huh, kid? Attack first, ask questions later. What you want with me? Much. Who are you anyway? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? In life, I was your partner. Jacob Marley. Jacob Marley. Jacob Marley. Oh my God, Marley, is that really you? You've been dead seven years. Man, you look terrible. You, you look like a bad lobster in a, in a dark cellar. It's a good Dickens reference, but the lobster, not many people would get that. Can you... Can you sit down? I can. I'll do it then. Then Dizzy deposited himself in a chair, as though it were as easy as sitting on a treasury bench. You don't believe in me, do you, Scrooge? You're right, I don't. 
What evidence would you have of my reality? Beyond that of your own senses. I don't know. Why do you doubt your own senses? Somehow you've poisoned me, invaded my home, my mind. You could be the big knuckles and collard greens I had for lunch. Sour gruel I ate at supper. An undigested bit of beef. A lot of mustard. A crumb of cheese. Or indigestion or drinking too much. This is glucose deprivation. It's gotta be the rough beef. Those potato skins with the sour cream and chives. Holograms. All done with laser light and extra special machines. Maybe I drank too much eggnog. Or perhaps still, you're some electrical disturbance of the nervous system. I mean, for all I know, you could be some kind of sexy alien squid monster who's feeding me depressing visions. You watch some really, really weird porn, don't you? There's more of gravy than the grave about you. Whatever you are. Scrooge was not much in the habit of cracking jokes. The truth is that he tried to be smart as a means of distracting his own attention and keeping down his horror. You see this toothpick? I do. You're not looking at it. But I see it notwithstanding, said the ghost, leaning closer to her, so close that if she were real, the two of them might have shared a kiss. Well, returned Scrooge, I have but to swallow this and be for the rest of my days persecuted by a legion of goblins all of my own creation. It's all humbug, I tell you. Humbug, I tell you. Humbug, I tell you. Humbug. 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 At this, the spirit raised a frightful cry. <laughs> Trouble spirit, why do you trouble me? Did you read the script? Man of a worldly mind, do you believe in me or not? I do, I must. But why do spirits walk the earth? And why do you come to me? I'm here to warn you, kid. Don't waste your life like I did. What are you talking about? I'm here to tell you that if you don't change your ways, you're gonna lose everything. I come to save you from sharing my fit, you cheap. Sucker. Please, just leave me alone. You are alone. You used to be cool, Scrooge. Now what's all this about you working late on Christmas Eve? Not cool, bro. You don't even leave your ivory tower on Christmas, kid. Your problem is, is that you've forgotten the spirit of the holidays. Oh, so this is supposed to help me discover the true meaning of Christmas? <laughs> no dice. You're obviously deranged. And if you do not leave my property immediately, I'll have you thrown out. I've come here to haunt you, and you dare talk that way to me? Get out of my head, Rico. I don't need lessons from a lawbreaker's ghost. Why are you so mean? Have you forgotten it's Christmas? Christmas. I'll give them Christmas. Fitzwilliam Ebenezer Dossie Scrooge, I will not allow you to sit here alone, drinking yourself to an early grave. You were such a smart kid. Did you get into dope? What? No. No. You mean after college. Look, ghost of Christmas goth, what do I have to do or say to get rid of you? You've got to lively up yourself, Ebenezer. You're really got to get in the Christmas spirit. You've got to change your way, Scrooge. It's not too late for you to reform. And I'm going to help you. Help me? I'm a very rich, powerful businessman. Sure, you're rich and powerful. But how many people can you actually say that you're friends with? And worse yet, when is the last time you got laid? Don't you worry about me, I'm fine. You ain't fine, Cindy. Or you ain't even close. You're on the same path I was on. You could be the greatest porn star ever in history, but you surround yourself with too much hate. For this vernon, you will pay. Know what I mean? This is gonna be a changing day in your life. It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men. Travel and procreate far and wide. And if that spirit does not go forth in life, it is compelled to do so after death. Doomed to wander the halls of academia as faculty emeritus. And for the day, confined to fast in fires till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away. I will never know peace. 
just eternal regret. It's an ever endless wet dream. And you keep waking up before you come. And in all these things, a great dark place established betwixt us and you, that they that will from hence pass to you be not able. The ends of Marley's chains rattled like metal pythons, like the train of a bridal rope. You haven't asked me why I'm strapped in these chains. Why, spirit? Why are you dressed like a kinky zombie? <laughs> These are the chains and handcuffs that bind me to this here earth. These chains are to remind me of my mistakes, how I threw away my life. These, Jason Ezer, are the cables of the many video game controllers I selfishly clung to in life. Bound by chains he forged in life. I made it. Link by link, yard by yard. With every single shitty thing that I did, don't remember you making chains. <laughs> Don't you get it? Every time Br'er Wolf was bad or mean to folks, he made another piece of the chain he has to carry after he is dead. They're really tacky. Oh no, I kind of like that dollar sign one. I have one just like it. Oh, thanks. Well, anyway, this will be your fate. The chain you will bear was full as heavy and as long as this seven Christmas Eves ago. You have labored on it since. It is a ponderous chain. Old Jacob Marley, tell me more. Speak comfort to me. I have no comfort to give, Ebenezer. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger anywhere. I have been traveling for seven years, Ebenezer. Seven years dead? And traveling all that time? The whole time. You travel fast. On the wings of the wind. In punishment for this neglect, I have been a silent witness to man's inhumanity to man, watching suffering beyond imagining, expiating the useless life I led. But you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance were my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehension ocean of my business. But I have good news. I came to warn you. To warn you. To warn you. You still have a chance of escaping your fate of being a 50-year-old boy. <gasps> I don't want to be 50. Oh, shut up and listen, you dipstick. All right, hang on. I got a couple of lines here. <clears throat> Tonight, you will be visited by three ghosts. Three ghosts. Three ghosts. Three ghosts. Three spirits. Three spirits. Three ghosts. Three spirits. Three ghosts. Three ghosts. Three spirits. Three spirits. Three spirits. Three ghostbusters. Three apparitions. Three parties. Three holes. Three more visitations. Three others. Three times more. Three extra dimensional intercessors. Three. Halloween ghosts. Three gassy ghosts. Three toxic ghosts. Three angry ghosts. Three, shall we say, free spirit. The ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future. The ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future. The ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future. The ghosts of hauntings past, present, and future. The spirit of safety past, safety present, and the spirit of safety future. It's basically Dr. Phil with ghosts. Ugh, I'd rather be fried in my own fondue. Each more terrifying than the last. Who are going to take you on a long journey, and when you come back, you're going to be a changed man, aren't you? Wait a minute. This isn't going to be another one of those Charles Dickens Christmas Carol things, is it? Exactly. Oh, sorpresa. Una trama homenaje a Dickens en Navidad. Estás cada vez más previsible. That's the Johnson hoop. It is. I think I'd rather not. I'm not in the mood for any weird shit. I'd rather be playing Scrabble. Without these visitors, you cannot hope to avoid the path that I have tread in my life. Do they have appointment? Says Scrooge Nouveau, vowing that if they do, he'll fire his executive assistant. Expect the first tomorrow when the bell tells one. The second, 18 and a half minutes later. The third, when the bell tolls thrice. Couldn't have eaten them all at once, get over with. Oh, don't be a dick! 
Marley, this is a witch hunt. This whole business with the three ghosts is just the latest excuse from a failing Democratic Party over an election Hillary should have won. Reform, Ebenezer Urkel. You have alienated everyone who loved you. Did I do that? Look to see me no more. And look that for your own sake you remember what has passed between us. Heed my words, sucker. Three ghosts, fool. There are ghosts. Desperate in his curiosity, Scrooge ran to the window. The air filled with phantoms, wandering hither and thither, moaning as they went. Each soul seemed imprisoned in its own pain, as if locked in the cell of a madhouse with neighbors screaming all around. God help us, everyone. Hey Scrooge, inside with your gold, got your money, cash control, Jacob Marley. Hey Scrooge, rolling in coin piles, Pratchett eats from discount aisles, Jacob Marley. All these characters and their stories swirl about the Dickens boy like a fog. Help me! Help me! He tried to say humbug, but found himself vocally incapacitated. He could not remember exactly where, but he had once read that an oral hallucination sometimes signals the onset of a stroke. The dream of her Christmas angel had been so very real. She half expected the robed form standing at her bedside. Scrooge leaned his diamond sword against the wall next to his bed and got back under his covers. A Christmas Carol will return after these messages. Stuffing! Mr. Scrooge loves the new stuffing and the five-piece holiday meal deal from Kentucky Fried Chicken. Perfect for the two of us. Heavens, it's the Cratchits! Hide the stuffing. We brought the ten-piece holiday meal. Just $9.99. I like the way you think, Cratchit. Get the five or ten-piece holiday meal deal at Kentucky Fried Chicken. Now return to A Christmas Carol, exclusively on Quibi. Are you ready to experience the shadows of things that have been? Humbug. It's Star 2, the first of the three spirits, with your DJ, Ebenezer Scrooge. window open. Hunjab, it's snowing in my room. Come close the window. Hello, Amanda. Scrooge found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew near. It was a strange figure. In red high heels and a sparkly turquoise and white tank dress, she looked like a little sexy elf playing hooky from Santa's workshop. Ebenezer could see garters holding up its stockings under the hem of its skirt. The ghost had the most alluring cologne she'd ever smelled, a robust woodsy scent that made Scrooge's toes curl in her shoes. His thin white locks were parted on his forehead. His form was bent, and as he extended his thin bony hand towards me, it shook like an aspen leaf. Good lord! It's a scary ghost! 
Are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas. The ghost of Christmas. The ghost of Christmas. The ghost of Christmas. <clears throat> past, present, or future. I am the ghost of Christmas past. 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 Well, to Christmas past. Ghost of Christmas past. Ghost of Christmas past out. Ghost of honesty and justice. Ghost of salesman past. Ghost of Arbor Day. Ghost of Christmas past. Ghost of Sarah Palin. Ghost of Christmas past. Ghost of puddings past. Ghost of Christmas past. Ghost of NCIS past. Ghost of Steven Spielberg. Ghost of Mistress past. Spirit of Liberace. Ghost of Christmas past. Ghost of Christmas me. Ghost Ghost of Christmas past! Ghost of DUI past. Ghost of Christmas past. Ghost of orchestras past. Ghost of the day after Christmas sale. Ghost of house cleaning past. Ghost of Roger Ailes. Ghost of Christmas past. Ghost of witness flip. Ghost of Christmas past. Ghost from its own past. Ghost of Christmas past. Ghost of Christmas past. Ghost of Christmas past. Ghost of TiVo past. Day of Christmas past. Ghost of podcast past. Ghost of the pre-industrial Economy. Ghost of good taste. Ghost of Christmas suck it. Ghost of Christmas past. Ghost of safety directors past. Ghost of bicycles never ridden. Ghost of showbiz past. Ghost of birthday presents yesterday. Ghost of Christmas past. The ghost of lunch tomorrow. Ghost of Christmas past. Ghost of anime past. Ghost of office Christmas parties past. Ghost of fashion victims past. Spirit of energy past. Ghost of New Year's past. Ghost of bars still past. Ghost of staffers past. Ghost of Christmas past. Ghost of Christmas past. Ghost of Christmas past. Ghost of privileged white girls past. Ghost of programmable logic past. Ghost of psycho past. Ghost of presents past. Ghost of breakfast past. Ghost of foot fungus past. The spirit of Christmas past. Spirit of Christmas past. Spirit of Christmas past. Ghost of Christmas never. Ghost of Christmas sh Ghost of Christmas coming. Ghost of past. Ghost of boyfriends past. Ghost of girlfriends past. Ghost of girlfriends past. Ghost of girlfriends past. Ghost of girlfriends past. Girlfriends of Christmas past. Ghost of Christmas past. Spirit of Christmas past. Ghost of Christmas hookups. Ghost of Christmas past. Spirit of Christmas past. Ghost of Christmas past. Ghost of Christmas past. Spirit of Christmas past. Ghost of Christmas ass. Christmas ass. Ghost of Christmas past. Ghost of your Christmas past. Ghost. Christmas past. Ghosts of relationships past. Ghosts of my relationships past. Spirits of relationships past. Ghosts of relationships past. Ghosts of bad sex past. Ghosts of parties past. Spirit of Christmas past. Spirit of pirate past. Ghost of Christmas past. Ghosts of Christmas special. Ghosts of Christmas screw you. Ghosts of Christmas stupid. Ghost of Christmas black. Ghost of she hulk past. Ghost of Christmas get your out of bed and treat your employees with basic holiday decency or face the wrath of Duke Nukem's chain gun. Ghost of Christmas past. 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 Kobe 11's 4KB. Ghost of Christmas past. Ghost of Christmas past. Yeah, well, I'm the ghost of who gives a What business brought you? Your welfare. And to help you stop being a dick. That's not how the story goes. I've come to show you Christmas as it should be. I knew it wasn't for a fashion show. Calvin! To change your ways, you must re-witness your evil deeds. Mm. Oh, come back! I'm not interested. I'm going back to sleep. Now you listen directly to me. You and I are going on a little trip. Into the past. Back in time, no one could do that. Didn't you say back to the future? But Christmas's past are a goulash of memory. Sasuke and Schwartzy and Hamaka Sklemory. Can I at least know where we're going? I'm gonna take you back to a time long, long ago, before I or anyone I respect was even born. 1996. The ghost became illuminated, like an oil lamp being turned up slowly by an unseen hand. 
The alien unspooled one ropey tentacle to clasp Scrooge gently by the arm. Rise and walk with me. I'll show you the first vision. Are you crazy? That's 12 floors down. Bear but a touch of my hand upon your heart, and you shall be upheld in more than this. I ain't going nowhere with you. Oh, yes, you are. The ghosts take him forward and backwards in time to see different Christmases, like that thing on Facebook that shows you old haircuts and people you don't talk to anymore. The ghost takes Trump back in time, forcing him to relive every sexist bit of commentary that has ever crossed his lips. Hey, when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Whatever you want. Grab him by the <laughs> I can do anything. First, though, the spirit flew Scrooge over Arab countries and into Europe. Billy Joe grasped the spirit by the neck, not worried about people thinking he was a homo because he was so scared. Scrooge took note of how the spirit's long hair streamed out as they sped along. I feel no atmosphere and no wind, so why does your hair blow out so as we move? Just an illustration that makes it easier to show our speed, replied the phantom. Are we deceased? No, your bodies are frozen while your spirits are separated from them. Try to relax. This is all quite normal for the spirit world. Hey, this looks just like the town where you grew up. I was thinking a sappy Christmas card. Welcome to your leap day past. The glowing ghost smiled and tickled old Ebenezer's balls to get his attention. Then pointed across the field. I... I know this place. You should, Ozu. This is your past. What? An involuntary smile spread across Scrooge's face as he watched all his old school friends running past. Why, there's young Melonhead. And shit for brains. Ooh, there goes Helmet. Ahoy, mateys! They can't hear you, Scrooge. This is the past. Long ago. We were just here to watch. Let us go on. School is not quite deserted. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there still. And that happy little boy is you. Tis Christmas morn, 1970. Scrooge himself looked upon his poor, forgotten self as he had used to be. I looked so, so happy. The spirit touched him on the arm and pointed to his younger self intent upon his reading. Suddenly, a man in foreign garments stood outside the window. Why, it's Alibaba! Scrooge exclaimed in ecstasy. Dear old honest Alibaba! Scrooge could no longer control himself. He wept. Wept as he never had before. Wept at the sight of his poor forgotten self as he once was so very long ago. He wanted so much to console the little boy he had once been. Let's see another Christmas. Grab my cake. We couldn't just use the stairs? It's more impressive this way. Where have you taken me, ghost of Christmas past? The air here is so clean and different than the city. Look around you, Ebenezer Scrooge. I think you'll recognize this place from your younger days. Do you know this place, Scrooge? Know it? Why, I was apprenticed here. All the lamps were lit, turning the workplace into a warm, pine-scented ballroom. And in came the men and women employed in the business. In came the housemaid, the cook, and the boy from across the way. Away they all went, 20 couple at once, hands half round and back again the other way, down the middle and up again, round and round in various stages of affectionate grouping. Look, Ebenezer, do you remember these happy Christmas scenes? I refuse to answer under the Fifth Amendment. There was cake, and there was negus, and there was a great piece of cold roast, and there was a great piece of cold boiled, and there were mince pies and plenty of beer. But the great effect of the evening came after the roast and boiled, when the fiddler struck up Sir Roger de Coverley. 
Then old Fezziwig stood out to dance with Mrs. Fezziwig. With a good stiff piece of work cut out for them, three or four and twenty pair of partners, people who were not to be trifled with, people who would dance and had no notion of walking. Old Fezziwig seemed to be everywhere at once, winking with his legs. A positive light appeared to issue from Fezziwig's calves. You couldn't have predicted at any given time what would have become of them next. And when old Fezziwig and Mrs. Fezziwig had gone through all the dance, advance and retire, both hands to your partner, bow and curtsy, corkscrew, feather needle and back again to your place, Fezziwig cut and came upon his feet again without a stagger. I solemnly declare that from all the crowd I saw in the factory that day, I cannot recall or separate one young face that gave me a painful impression. This is how America should be again. That was my slogan, by the way. Make America great again. Scrooge stood transfixed to see these memories of times gone by. And dear old Fezziwick, he thought. Oh, was there ever a kind of man? So he spent a bit of cash on some song and dance. Where's your prize in that, eh? But it wasn't the money Fezzy we spent that made us think highly of him. He has the power to make these people happy or unhappy. To make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. The happiness he gave, I gave was quite as great as though it had cost a thousand pounds. Just small things. So what's the matter? Nothing. Something, I think. Well, I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now. That's all. My time grows short. Quick. Hang on! Hey everyone, Heath here. So, this is what I have completed so far. I do have another hour edited, but it's still in disconnected chunks. I haven't been able to Frankenstein it all together just yet. This is very disappointing to me. I have been working on this off and on for the last four years and really hoped 2020 would be when I'd finished the full story. There's just so much material and like a hundred new Christmas carols come out each year. It's hard to keep up with it all. And I really do want to do the entire story using everything I can find, trying to be respectful of the material while giving it the middle finger at the same time. There are times I'm working on this where I wish someone would have punched me right in the fucking face for having thought it up. It'll be fun, I said. Won't take that long. Humbug. 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 All right, anyway, remaining staves will be coming Christmas 2021. Thank you for your patience. Next time on A Christmas Carol Encyclopedia. What is this? Is this like 1997? It's 96. Gotcha, foxy lady. Cage, you big bully. Tackling a girl's no fair. Cage ain't home, Claire. Just Luke. You have one final scene to watch, Mr. Scrooge. <laughs> bah humbug. Who are you? I am the ghost of Christmas who just can't seem to get it together. What's happened? Where am I? What if I told you we were putting a team together? Who was we? Ich bin a kleine Dreider, der macht mir nicht vom Leid. Dumm nur mir alles spielen, in Dreider 1, 2, 3. Oi, Dreider, 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 oi, Dreier sich, Dreider, Dreier. Dumm nur mir alles spielen, in Dreider 1, 2, 3. Ich hol Litz zu tanzen. Round you.
your foreheads the garlands twine, drown sorrow in a cup of wine, and let us all be merry. Now all our neighbors chimney smoke, and Christmas blocks are burning. Their ovens there with baked meats choke, and all the spits are turning. Without a door, let sorrow lie, and if for cold it have to die, we'll bear it in a Christmas pie, and evermore be merry.
Now there is a version of Silent Night that's anything but silent to General Arius and his Val Verdes with a hidden track from their new CD, Modern Ancient Christmas Carols, Part 2, very peculiar versions of holiday favorites. Now here's a holiday song I sneaked into the show a couple of months ago from the latest CD by Steve Martin and the Steep Canyon... 